Welcome to EPG Parashala. I am Professor B. Hari Haran from the Institute of English, University of Kerala. The paper that we are looking at is 20th century English literature and the module is on Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. Let's begin. Samuel Beckett is an Irish novelist, poet and playwright. He wrote in English and French. He is an avant-garde writer who was influenced by James Joyce's literary style. Waiting for Godot, which was premiered in 1956, was his first and most famous play. He won the Nobel Prize in 1969. His important works include in prose, Proust. He has published three novels, Murphy, Malone and The Unnameable. His collection of poetry includes Echoes, Bones and Other Precipitates. The important plays include Waiting for Godot, 1956, Endgame, 1957, Crap's Last Ta Tape, Happy Days and Play. What we can do now is to have a general awareness of absurd theatre and understand something of the avant-garde quality nature of modern drama. We will also try and identify various themes that are incorporated in some of these plays. We will also look at the language, form and content in modernist literature, particularly theatre and analyse the relevance, the universal relevance of these plays today. We will begin with the term absurd. This is a central concern in post-World War literature. This is a word that we come across when we read The Myth of Sisyphus by Albert Camus. I assume that all of you know the story of Sisyphus who was cursed to roll a stone up the hill and when he reached the top, the stone rolled down. This was made into a narrative by none other than Albert Camus to talk about the futility of living in this world, the futility of all endeavor and all effort. Now, Sisyphus myth is used by the absurd playwrights to parallel, to highlight man's futile quest to understand the absurdity of human existence. Now, the term, the theatre of the absurd, was coined by Martin Eslin and he used the term absurd to label this innovative, unconventional modern play. But then he also goes on to talk about how these absurd plays go back and use many of the conventions with which uh, the English theatre had developed. This is uh, in a way a, very com a compulsory or a must read for any student of contemporary or 20th century drama, Martin Eslin's Theatre of the Absurd. I would urge the student here to read this book. It, the book also talks about the plays, some of the absurd plays that you have to study in your course. Now, I would now talk about very briefly introduce some of the major absurd dramatists. Samuel Beckett is one, Jean Genet, Eugene Ionesco, Arthur Adamov, Tom Stoppard, Harold Pinter, there are a number of these plays. We will now very briefly list out some important plays that came out. Beckett's Waiting for Godot, Jean Genet's The Maids, Eugene Yonesco's The Ball Soprano, Adamov's Ping Pong, Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead and there are many many more. The list is only very limited. I urge you to take up uh, the uh, Martin Essen book to understand more about 
these plays, the list of these plays and at least know something about what these plays engaged with. We will now look at some of the features of absurd drama. As I said, Martin is, uh, when, when, we, when I talked earlier, I was talking about the unconventionality of this. But then, it is generally believed that these plays violated the traditional principles of theatre. What are the traditional principles of drama? We would talk about plot, we would talk about a rising action, we would talk about uh, the, the climax, the falling action, the denouement, etc. We talk about the development of plot, the development of story, action. We talk about uh, how it has a neat structure, things happen, events happen. We talk about um, catharsis. We talk about um, recognition, reversal. We talk about events and incidents that happen. But then, when you look at, when you watch an absurd play, you will not be able to recognize or even identify many of these things because they simply do not have it. Their intent, their purpose is something else. Another thing, feature of absurd drama is that there is no coherent story. If you look for a story, you are doomed, you will not get it. There is no well-made plot. The dialogues are fragmented. It, is, it could be meaningless sometimes. There would be cliches. There would be nonsense that is bandied. You would have noises, you would have silence, you would have pause. In other words, language in this place is a tool of non-communication. These plays project an element of fantasy and they abound in black humor. I hope we all know what black humor is. It's dark. It's not funny. It could be a very funny situation, but then you will not feel like laughing. There could be futile actions. A drama, you, you, you watch something and if you want to call that a drama, a play, then it, is, it will be dependent on action. But then the actions here in, this, in these plays would be futile. The settings are bare, they are desolate. The characters are like puppets. Often they are helpless and maybe they, are, they become helpless victims of cruelty, helpless victims of fate, fate that is cruel. The, the thing that to emphasize here is that you, all, you will always have victims and they will invariably be helpless. You will also have fluid, indefinite sequence of time. Time is a very important factor in these plays. There is great fluidity and the sequence could be indefinite and it, it can emerge. It sometimes very often, it very often becomes a major trope in these plays. So the idea of time that you have here is not the kind of time that we are familiar with when we, uh, let's say, read uh, Greek tragedies or French plays, the traditional French plays or the Elizabethan playwrights or even the plays that came up after that. The sense of time here is something else. The dominant themes in absurd drama, a very prominent theme in absurd drama has to do with anxiety and alienation. Now, to understand why is it that we have these themes, when we ask this question, we will have to go back to the times when these, were, these plays were written. There was this existential or, or even philosophical crisis at the turn of the 20th century. Nietzsche, in his Das Pek Zarathustra, had talked about the death of God. There were no verities, no certainties. The war created an intellectual crisis, so to speak. You are cut off from roots, you are cut off from your moorings. That's when existentialism as a philosophy came up. 
alienation and anxiety became a relatively modern phenomena and this was a theme that recurred in the 20th century particularly in its literary expressions what is anxiety anxiety was simply that unfocused and unnecessary worries that we had about life there was this big worry that we had about failure about things that you could look forward to there was nothing that you could even hope for and this was anxiety and what was the result of this of this anxiety and alienation it was simply estrangement which resulted from this inability to adapt to one's circumstances now this became so very compelling that you had no where to turn to you had no support you couldn't look up to anything you are alienated from your surroundings and that's when you started thinking that you are condemned to be free in other words this anxiety and alienation translated itself into the condition to this condition of the absurd and this is what you were living through there was this dailiness there was this repetition which you were not able to come to terms with and you did not know what to do with your life and this is how it became the situation of sisyphus when you look at the play it has about it has six characters in it well that is a significant number but out of this only five characters appear on stage they are astragon or gogo vladimir or didi there's a character called lucky and there's another character called pozo and there is a boy the boy is not recognized in this play by any name he's only the boy and there is godo godo never appears on the stage godo is referred to in the play there is nothing else that we know we we, we never see godo no one in the play sees godo the play is a tragedy comedy as i said in two acts now why is it called a tragedy comedy now this is a question that you will have to ponder as you read the play the setting of the play is a deserted country road there's nothing else there is a there is a tree that is bare and there's a deserted country road and it's wild this is the bare outline setting of the play it's evening as the play opens the first act it's evening there's a lonely country road there's a leafless willow tree there's a mound of dirt we have two middle aged tramps who are dressed in rags estragon we see estragon as the play opens trying to pull on his boots which are very tight he is hard bent he is intent on that at that point vladimir soon joins him and then you hear these words nothing to be done imagine opening a play with these words nothing to be done and then these two men estragon and vladimir discuss godo they they talk to each other and they say that they are here waiting for godo this sets off the tone of the play so they discuss they tell each other that they are waiting for somebody 
and they also they also remind themselves that there's nothing to be done and they while away time by pulling on the boot exchanging hats their stick pulling up their trousers trying to munch carrots and they even end up playing games when you read the play you will wonder what is this about is this a play what are these people saying the dialogues will sound to be meaningless there is no serious action nothing happens in this play there are but if you if you are a careful reader when you read it you would find that there are biblical references to the gospel there are specific references here to the crucifixion of christ between two thieves where one attained salvation the other is damned to hell it's so rich in that sense this text is so much layered as this goes on pozo enters pozo is a very affluent a very rich man he is a landowner who abuses his servant lucky now this is how he comes so pozo is apparently plump and lucky is not all that plump he is very lean and lucky pozo has a whip with which he beats his servant now you have here the master slave relationship symbolized presented here by pozo's whip and there is a rope around lucky's neck and you have pozo pulling the rope and lucky in the front and pozo behind him and so there are some of these instructions that pozo barks at lucky stand sit walk come eat give there are these one word commands and lucky obeys in this act lucky does not open his mouth till he is asked to and at one point pozo asks him to speak and he speaks he speaks like a programmed robo or a computer non stop after this they leave the two men leave and then they are still waiting and the boy the, there's a boy who comes here he is a messenger and he gives a message what is the message godo will not come that day they are these are two men who are waiting for godo mr godo told me that godo he will not come today now the two men didi and gogo estragon and vladimir debate what should we do should we leave or should we wait for godo they debate and the first act ends there the trams do not move from the place in other words there is no progress in the action of the play this is one element of absurd drama there is no progress the play at the end of the first act we find these two men standing there nothing much has happened they have wiled away their time they have nothing else to do they play games they play different kinds of games these these games are very interesting because they take you back to some of the things that we might have watched as children um in films one need to think of the films of charlie chaplin for example now it goes back some of the actions in this play goes back to the films of charlie chaplin it will go back to the uh the slapstick comedy of clowns in the circus think of the clowns what they do they will have a stick and it will be split in the middle and with this they will beat the other person it will make a sound that is a slapstick so what you have here is beckett borrowing from many of these sources and yet nothing much nothing happens really in act 1 and there's nothing to be done shall we go yes we can go but then they do not go 
Nobody comes, nobody goes, nothing happens. It's off room. Now this is the refrain that you have in the play. Now let's look at what you have in this act. This, whatever we have seen in the first act, is a vivid portrayal of human suffering. The scene seems to highlight the sad state of modern man. These characters that we see in the first act are modeled on post-war modern society. There is suffering from anxiety, there is loneliness, there is alienation, there is depression, there is insecurity. They are all there and they are all communicated to you without much happening really on the stage. In other words, you have that condition presented as it is on the stage. You are not told about the condition. The condition is presented to, presented to you as it is. Now, this is what the play does. The second act opens. The background is the same. Nothing has changed. There is only one difference. This willow tree has sprouted a couple of leaves. Now, can we see this as a symbolic change in the situation? We will have to wait and see. Now, Estragon has forgotten the events of the previous day. And Vladimir tells him, didn't we come here? Didn't we wait here? Didn't we wait for Mr. Godo? He did not come, that's why we are here. He reminds him all these things. And now, these two triumphs spend their time staring at a distance and they indulge again in nonsensical chat and actions which do not mean much. So, in other words, the action, the sequence is not significantly different from what we witness in the first act. Now, what happens is Pozo and Lucky enter. There is a slight difference here again. Pozo is blind. Lucky is dumb. He cannot speak. Remember, in the earlier act, Pozo was active. He could command and Lucky gives this speech which is breathless. Now, we have the dumb slave still faithfully looking after his blind and abusive master. And yet, there is no change in the situation. You have these two trams waiting for Mr. Godo. This act also takes up this endless waiting. And this continues. Waiting, there is a, this waiting is the ing form of the verb wait. And waiting continues. And that's how the play ends. Now there, what happens is, the man, uh, the boy comes and says, look, Mr. Godo could not come today, maybe he'll come tomorrow. So nothing much has happened. Now, we will look at the two characters, Vladimir and Estragon. Now it's very difficult to talk about characterization in the conventional sense of the term when we look at a play like this. And I'm sure that this would be kind of clear to you. You will probably even be wondering, what play is this? But then, when this play was performed in a prison in France, this was written first in French, the hardcore criminals in that prison were all able to relate to this play. The play did communicate something to each one of them. So let us now look at the characterization. Vladimir is the assertive of the two. He has a good memory of events. He, is, he has some empathy in him. He is the one who protests at the way in which Pozo treats Lucky. He very much believes that Godo will come to save him and his friend. Estragon on the other hand is timid and submissive. He is forgetful. He is dreamy. He is a very sensitive man. He is at the same time unpredictable. 
he is not very certain about the existence of Godo. So you can see the contrast here and places where the two meet or the way in which one person completes the other person. He has an obsession. His obsession is to take his boots off and on. That is obsession. So these are the two main characters, so to speak. We will now look at Lucky and Pozo. Lucky is the slave. He is slavery, symbolized by a rope around his neck. And he carries the burden without any resistance. He is mute in the second act. He is a loyal, at the same time passive servant. Now, Lucky can be seen to represent or present modern man enslaved by suffering. Now, these features that we are trying to talk about are by no means definitive. We cannot say that this is what they mean. Beckett was once asked in an interview what he meant by this play and he said, if I knew, I would have said that. Let's come to Pozo. Pozo is a very rich landowner. He is a figure that we would instantly dislike. He is abusive. He uses the whip to control his slave. He is blind in the second act. There is no change in the relationship that he has with Lucky, his slave. He portrays tyranny. The boy who appears twice, very briefly in the act, first act he appears once and the second act also he makes a brief appearance. He, he is a messenger. He is, supposed, he is the only person who is supposed to have a contact with Godo. We don't know who Godo is. So he is the only person who has some contact with Godo. He comes at the end of both the acts and he delivers only one message. Godo will not come. And there is Godo. Godo is perhaps the only source of salvation. Godo could be another form of God. Godo is invisible throughout. You have no information whatsoever on Godo. Godo could symbolize many things. He can be, to give one instance, he can be a symbol of meaningless waiting. He can be a symbol of faith, he can be a symbol of hope, he can be a symbol of many things. It all depends on how you choose to, how you want to look at him. This is Godo for you. What are the themes that we have here? Alienation. Suffering, anxiety, boredom, friendship, expectancy, positive, no, vain expectancy, waiting is a thing, denial, nihilism, it's up to the reader or a person who has watched this play to come up to discover many more themes. What I have indicated are a few of them. Now, before we conclude, this play has been translated, presented in many languages. It's a test for actors to mouth these lines because of the silences and the pauses that you have here. This is a play that will be effective on stage only if you are an actor who knows, who has a sense of timing and who does it well. This is a play that uh, uh, has been recorded. It's available uh, in very popular websites. I would urge you to read the play first and then watch it. To conclude, Waiting for Godot is a mystery wrapped in an enigma. It signifies the eternal recurrence of human life. It talks about man's helplessness 
to change his destiny. It's a very candid portrayal of modern society. I would like to conclude this lecture by urging you to look at this text and then see how you can relate to the condition that is presented in it. I hope you enjoy reading this play and I hope you are able to think about this play. Thank you.